Warning, if anybody's going to bring out the profanity in us, it's these religious motherfuckers. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Satanic Boat Magic. That's right, Christians. We can sink your boats with nothing but our love of sin. Satanic Boat Magic. Putting the mine back in mind powers. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Yo, 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 this is the one and only gay atheist rapper known as Nightlighter. And as an ex-Christian that used to say amen, I assure you we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men. Day. It's September 10th. And it's International Creepy Boston Dynamics Robotic Horse Day. I don't think it's creepy at all. You hear that, robot horse? I don't think it's creepy at all. I'm on your side. Its name is don't Big Dog, and it is our scary. redeemer. I'm no illusions. <laughs> I'm Eli Bosnick. Back up, back up. I was nice to you. I'm Heath Henright. <laughs> and from John Travolta's New Jersey, How dare Cincinnati you? Swing State, and Good Husband, Georgia, this is the Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Michael Cohen knew Trump was an atheist before it was cool. <laughs> Michael Marshall, editor of The Skeptic, did COVID. And Michael Marshall will be here to argue that he did not, in fact, do COVID. Yeah, he did. But first, okay. the diatribe. <laughs> It's really weird when they bring up the Bible now. Like, I'll be honest with you. I got into a lot of arguments about what the Bible said and didn't say way before I'd read the thing. I mean, I guess there wouldn't be much point in pretending otherwise, since you can still go back in the archives of this show and listen to me do it. But I, I figured it was fair since the person I was arguing with invariably also hadn't read the Bible. Yeah, you know, sure, we were two blind people arguing about the color of a dish towel, but I still trusted my sources more than theirs. And for reasons that are probably obvious, it was way less awkward back then, you know, because we would skirt up towards the edge of having to actually know what we're talking about. But then we would back away mutually. But nowadays, I just I run up to that edge. I dive off. I get a mile or so down. And then I look back up at the precipice and I see them standing there admitting that they, uh, you know, just mostly only read the parts in the chick tracks. It makes it really fucking weird because the Bible doesn't just say shit they don't know about. It doesn't just lack the things that they think are there. It's not even the kind of thing that they think it is. Right? Like based on the disparate sentences their pastors cherry pick for them, they get the impression that it's some kind of collection of wisdom mixed with some Aesop's fables type parables and some rules to live by. They think it's a collection of stories or a, a repository of moral pronouncements or an examination of theology. And while a clever enough pastor can pluck out a couple dozen sentences that would reinforce any of those misconceptions, nobody could read any significant percentage of the book and maintain them. See, the, the problem is that the Bible isn't pretending to be what all these Christian leaders are pretending it is. You know, ask a Christian what the Bible is or, or what it's about, and you'll get descriptions that no objective person could attach to that book. You know, set aside the literalists and shit who would call it the perfect word of God. Take one of those uber flimsy liberal definitions that settle for like, you know, divinely inspired effort to understand God's nature or something. I mean, it, yes, it's not divinely inspired, but beyond that, it's not an effort to understand God's nature. It's a story about a guy who made poop bread. It's a list of people's great, 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 great grandfathers. It's a letter from an ungrateful house guest that thinks you could have been a bit more accommodating. At no point could it even be mistaken for the thing that virtually every Christian will tell you it is. But most Christians don't know that because they've never read the damn thing. And even many who have read it don't know because they were told what it was so emphatically and so often before they read it that it never occurred to them how different it actually turned out to be. But consider the disparity, right? The authors of the Bible clearly had no fucking clue that people were going to be reading this shit thousands of years later. And it's patently obvious as you read it, like, like the parts where it invokes physical evidence for a story. Right, like everybody piled up a rock to commemorate that moment. And even today, you can go to the river and see that pile of rocks. Well, you know, set aside how dumb the, oh, yeah, well, then where did this pile of rocks come from argument is. And consider the fact that they were writing that shit thousands of years ago. 
Like, needless to say, that pile of rocks isn't there anymore. That river's not there anymore in many instances. Now, obviously, you wouldn't write something like that if you were divinely inspired by a perfect being because a perfect being would know this book is going to be around thousands of years later, you know, after people have decided to move those rocks. But, but, but it also isn't something a person would write if they thought that they were divinely inspired or if they even had the vaguest notion that people were going to be reading this thing for a long time or even if they were contemplating the nature of God. The question they're tackling isn't what is God or how should we live in the world? It's where the fuck did that big pile of rocks come from? It should come as no surprise then that people who dig into the book trying to find answers for questions unrelated to rock pile origins come up wanting. Of course, on the rare occasion, I find myself arguing the Bible with a Christian these days. They're generally not going to be deploying the most liberal possible definition for the Bible. So I find myself arguing with people who actually want to argue that it's a book of answers handed down from on high and authored directly from Jesus of Nazareth with a goddamn quill pen. And sure, that's an argument I can win. But like I said, it's awkward as all hell. When my knowledge was limited to, you know, but yeah, but what about these passages that don't fit your description? We could dance around that for quite a while. But now my argument is you might as well have just called the Bible a potato. Right. It's harder at that point to find a comfortable place to land because, A, where do you even start the the Bible isn't a potato argument? And B, what possible middle ground are you going to land on between random collection of old papers religious people had and potato? Right, like, to be clear, if atheists had the opportunity to rewrite the Bible for the express purpose of making it hard for our opponents in an argument to defend, I don't think we'd change a goddamn word. So the argument can't even be about interpretation. They have to argue that the book doesn't say what it says. And I guess anybody can see how that gets awkward real quick. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Lizzie and Gordo to my Miranda, Heath then right and Eli Bosnick. <laughs> Fellas, are you ready to tell me what the hell I just referenced? I actually oh, know. <laughs> as if you didn't know, Heath's our Gordo. Yeah. Okay. And, and Eli is definitely a lot like Hillary Duff. That's, I've always said that. <laughs> Lizzie McGuire, classic. That's what oh, I say. Yeah, well, In our lead story tonight. In Snitches Get Riches news. Right. Fantastic. Convicted felon, graduate of the prestigious Thomas M. Cooley Law School <laughs> of Western Michigan, <laughs> and guy who needs to adjust the aspect ratio on his face a little bit. Right. A lot. A lot. Michael Cohen just released his tell-all book entitled Disloyal, a memoir. It's the story of his time working for Donald Trump as a fixer because... <laughs> Donald Trump is a perfectly innocent man who needed a dedicated attorney to fix legal stuff as it came up. As a company who has one of those, I want to emphasize how totally plausible that is. All kinds of good reasons <laughs> that one could have that. <laughs> well, turns out that yelling the N-word during casual conversation is not covered by attorney-client privilege. Huh. No. And also, you know, Cohen already got disbarred for... The felonies, right, so well, I guess yeah. it's a moot point. <laughs> so we got a not at all surprising glimpse into the giant lie that is the presidency of Donald Trump. And that includes the giant lie that he's a Christian who deserves the unwavering support of the evangelical community that got him elected. Well, okay, wait, wait. Either he yells the N-word during casual conversation or he's not the man the evangelicals wanted. It can't be both, Heath. Yeah, pick. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a good point. So I haven't read the book, but the New York Times got an advanced copy and gave us a little preview. And here's a few highlights. I'll start with a lengthy section from the book, apparently, about race with the following topic sentence from Michael Cohen. As a rule, Trump expressed low opinions of all black folks. And then a whole section about that. And apparently that low opinion includes calling Nelson Mandela a bad leader. And also challenging Cohen to, quote, name one country run by a black person that isn't a shithole. At which point, Cohen mumbled something about Obama and America. And Trump was like, get out, get out. It was, it was rhetorical for all intensive purposes. Imminent domain. Whatever. <laughs> I could care less. And that brings us to the part 
that should actually have an effect on the election and change the minds of Christian people. But it won't. No. I mean, mm -mm. if information could change the minds of Christian people, there wouldn't really be Christian people. But no, good point. here's hoping it might affect their voting behavior a little bit. Cohen described Trump's meeting with a bunch of evangelical leaders right before the 2016 election, during which they all laid their hands on Trump in prayer. And after they all left, Trump said to Cohen, can you believe people believe that shit? <laughs> which is weird, because based on who we know was in that room, he could have said it to half of them and they would have been like, right? They brought me a jet, dude, a jet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you got to get in on this. It's really. Yes. <laughs> so, Michael Cohen, we know you're listening, mostly because you're under house arrest right now, which is our current business model. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. So, first of all, Fuck you for making me agree with one single sentence from Donald Trump. Right, I don't yeah. like that I had, like, <laughs> I don't believe people believe that shit. Also, that ankle bracelet, it's probably super itchy. Like, <laughs> I, like I imagine if you're able to stop thinking about it, it's probably fine. But, but if somebody reminds you about it, that's got to be just several hours of scratching it raw with a ruler. Like, just yeah. getting in there mm -hmm. down to the bone <laughs> for sure. And in Use Your Exclusion news tonight, Wisconsin Reverend and Archbishop of the Freeman of the Land Diocese, James Altman, went viral over the weekend with a video claiming that one, quote, cannot be Catholic and be a Democrat, period, end quote. Hmm. A position somewhat undercut by the plurality of Catholics' voter registrations. <laughs> so, to be clear, according to Pew, 44% of Catholics are Democrats compared to 37% that are Republicans. Uh, and one of those Catholic Democrats, of course, is the goddamn presidential nominee. Yeah, it's no big deal. Yeah. JFK Catholic. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. But none of that matters to Altman, who declared them to be illusory Scotsmen by way of abortion being baby murder. <laughs> hey, uh, Catholicism, just quick, quick idea. What if you guys focus on the welfare of kids with an age that's positive? For now? Right, you know, yes. Just really drill down on that internal policy. <laughs> figure that one out for yourselves. And and then you can go and do the, the negative numbers once you got that all set. <laughs> right. So in his batshit rant, Altman declared climate change to be a hoax, said all Democrats are going to hell, and perhaps most unbelievably of all, claimed that the Catholic Church was a moral force. He also well, included this huh. amazing dig. He, he's talking about how godless our politicians are over pictures of Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden and evil music. And he says, quote, we can see in so many godless politicians in the godless educational system, in the godlessness of so many sheeples. <laughs> yes, he felt that word needed pluralized. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the word he's looking for is persons. <laughs> Schmoose? Schmoose. Jesus. <laughs> All right. So, but uh, anyway, the qu quote goes on. The godless of so many sheeples that are most definitely serving him, they are not <laughs> fulfilling so their purpose in life. End quote. Oh, man. I really hope the Speaker of the House listens to the self proclaimed virginal head of a Nazi gold funded child rape cabal and, and you know, make something of herself. Right. Really, yeah. Really exactly. Put yourself out there. Hmm. Of course, the the crux of his argument is that Catholics can't belong to the party that supports abortion rights. In fact, he goes as far as claiming that when Catholic Democrats get to the pearly gates of heaven, there will be, quote, 60 million and counting aborted babies standing at the gates of heaven, barring your Democrat entrance, end quote. <laughs> really? <laughs> it huh. sounds adorable. <laughs> that's, a, that's a that's a weird defensive line. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Just running stunts Most of them will be so stuff. small, you can't really see them. You're going to be stepping on them going, oh, shit, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're the size of a matchstick, though. So, <laughs> but right. you hit that A-gap really nice. I got to <laughs> give you that. <laughs> but, of course, as many outlets have pointed out in conjunction with this story, abortion rates actually go up under Republican policies of, you know, closing Planned Parenthoods, abstinence-only education, opposition to birth control, etc. So even if your goal is reducing abortion, you're still better off with the Democratic Party. Yeah, obviously. But if you really want to make that game of Red Rover at the Pearly Gates a challenge, I guess keep voting Republican. <laughs> Tough call. Tough okay. call, because that, that could be fun. I, okay, group question. I'm pretty 
pretty sure I could fight my way through 60 million fetuses, right? I like, do not think that's it, true. It would take me a while. I think Noah and I could. And <laughs> you're going to be sticky at the end, but this is, this is not a duck-sized horses situation. <laughs> right, I think I no, exactly, exactly. Well, especially if it's all of us, with all the Democrats versus 60 million, come on. The fetuses don't stand a fucking chance. Oh, Kamala is just leading the charge. You just you oh. just follow behind her like Mean Joe Green. Yeah, no, she runs like a lead blocker. You're yeah. fine. You're Hell plowing yeah. through that. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you can most definitely be a Catholic Democrat. And you look, nobody's more disappointed than me, Jimmy. I would love it <laughs> if they had all seen your video and they thought, fuck, you're right, and demanded a refund for their contribution to the cemetery maintenance fund. But yeah. it turns out that you just managed to be wrong for a Catholic priest, <laughs> which, though impressive, doesn't make you matter. Sorry, bud. Mm. <laughs> and next up in headlines, thousands of people are yelling a misquoted passage from the Constitution at a minimum wage retail employee right, right. now. That's true. You That's can hear them in a seashell. certainly shell. happening. <laughs> and by Constitution, I actually mean anything from any of those you know, old-timey America papers, whatever. <laughs> the parchment. I hold this truth to be self-evident. One of those people Fantastic. is Pastor Greg Locke, screaming at the front door of a Dunkin' Donuts that he won't wear a mask, but he will blow someone for 28 creamers and 28 sugar packets. <laughs> but this week's winner for being detained the hardest by a mask policy is Coach Dave Dobenmeyer, uh. who went into a cell phone store and refuse to wear a mask because a mask policy is just like a segregated lunch counter refusing to serve a black person. <laughs> what is the question? Yeah. Hey, hey, I can't wait to read his screed in my own poop from an Alabama jail. I think it's really, really moving. Yeah, so the whole thing was confusing for the staff at that store because Coach Dave normally yells about, you know, how the retailer he's visiting should be refusing black people if they want. Yeah, that's a basic does. freedom. It's but thing. this time, segregation was apparently a bad thing in his rant. So yeah. it's confusing. Right, to be fair, that was the first time you told us for sure whether he was for or against mask policies. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I got there eventually, but yes, it's tricky. So here's how it all went down. And this is according to Coach Dave. This is him yeah. telling the story <laughs> on purpose from his, his perspective. Side. His side. Yeah. So... <laughs> He walked into a T-Mobile store, which is done. Just I'm done. It's perfect it's already. already. Yes. The best. Too <laughs> fucking perfect. Coach Dave's platonic form is a T-Mobile cell phone holster. Like that's, <laughs> that's him. So he walks into the store looking to get a holster for his holster or mm -hmm. his collection yeah. of holsters or just underarms inside with the cowboy thing, whatever. The guy at the desk starts to politely remind him about the mask policy and Coach Dave immediately yelled, I ain't wearing no mask. At which point I'm really hoping the T-Mobile guy said, oh, great. That fits perfectly with our policy of not not wearing a mask. So we're all good. <laughs> Either way, Coach Dave continues, I know the mask doesn't work. I'm not wearing it. That's bearing false witness. You know, I, I, for one, appreciate all the work he's doing to ensure that Karen doesn't become just a sexist stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's Darren. He's all the way Darren. So <laughs> Coach Dave invokes the, the ninth commandment about symbolic mask lying mm -hmm. that we all know about, or eighth, depending on which stupid fucking yeah. version of that thing. And the T-Mobile guy says, okay, you know what? Don't worry. We actually had to set up an outdoor work area just for people like you. That's a real thing that we've had to do in the retail sector. <laughs> I'll build your fucking meta holster out here. <laughs> And that's when Coach Dave did what he was put on this earth to do. Uh, he demanded to see the manager? He, he, yeah, that is correct. He yeah, demanded and he to is. see the manager. So the manager comes out and Dave says, ma'am, I have a heart condition. It's medical. As opposed as, to recreational. As opposed to the non-medical <laughs> heart conditions, apparently. I don't know. It's medical. I think I was born with this medical condition. I'm not sure. I think I was. Would you refuse to serve somebody because they're black? Oh. Sorry, that was supposed to be rhetorical. Then I remembered I live in Ohio. So let me let me rephrase that. <laughs> what I love is that he can't wear a mask because that's bearing false witness. But by his own admission, he can lie about his medical history. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, Coach Dave, you never cease to amaze me. Yeah. And again, 
just to be clear, that was Coach Dave telling his fucking side of the story. Yep. In which he, the guy who said mixed race marriage is wrong because seals don't fuck rhinos at the zoo. Yep. That guy told the manager of a T-Mobile store that she's a segregationist as the good guy in his story on his show. <laughs> and this is my favorite part. He explains how the manager stormed away at that point, And then he added, ruin my whole day. <laughs> Which I fucking love. I'm assuming he never got that holster and he ended up severely hurting himself trying to cope with, you know, unfamiliar pocket technology. <laughs> and in holy sea news, turns out, that Jerry Fulwell Jr. might have been more godly than we think as he sat in the corner and watched his wife get fucked by the pool boy because this week, Rasta-themed Joe Rogan impersonator Pastor <laughs> Todd White. Ooh, ooh, Todd White's back. Ooh, yes. Ooh. He took to YouTube to let us know that God watches you yank it, and yes, he watches you come. Does he? You know what? I like to think about all the other people coming at the same time as me. You know, like, it's like... Yeah, it makes you think about the world. Like, we're all connected, right? Like, humanity. Wait, if we're all connected, I'm pretty sure that makes Eli like the all-father or it Gaia does. or it something. It does. It's true. <laughs> yeah. So, for those unfamiliar with Todd White, uh, do yourself a little favor. Stop the car. Get off the treadmill. Whatever you're doing. And Google this human. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people are on treadmills right now. Yeah. Some of them. Well, our listeners. Yeah. <laughs> One or two are on the treadmill. Anyways, he is a walking preaching reminder that damn we really got to get on YouTube one of these days <laughs> he made it onto our show for the first time last year when he claimed to help grow someone's short leg back to regular size <laughs> uh, and imagine the kind of altruism it takes to use your body fixing god powers on somebody else's leg while your head still looks like that <laughs> yeah that's a lot that's a lot anyway since then, he apparently found a mirror and has really decided to, you know, commit to saying shit that's as silly as he looks. <laughs> well, almost as silly as he looks. Yeah, uh, okay. Because this, this is what he had to say about pornography this week. Quote, your whole pornography thing, you think like no one knows about it? God's watching it with you. He waits till you reach climax. What? Okay. Interesting. He waits. <laughs> All right. Well, fun game for everybody. If you edge it for a while, you know, I mean, like God's going to get kind of impatient, starts tapping his watch. Like, come on, man. I got, I got places to go. I got other porn to watch yeah. and wait for people to come. <laughs> yeah. So for this next part of the quote, I think he's talking as God. N not sure. If he only knew me, if he only desired to know me, I would be his climax. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get an honorable mention. Uh <laughs> Fantastic. Just got on a casting couch, like, all right, well, I've got, I've got plenty of stepkids. <laughs> get, get into the show. But there is good news here. I am pretty sure I just figured out the reason for the problem of evil if Todd is right. Because I don't know about you guys, but if I was God and I had to watch Todd White Climax, I also would have sent out COVID and murder warnings. So, yeah, I'm a Christian. All right. Well, now that we also have to rinse out our mind's eye, we're going to take a quick break and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate race. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. Okay, so it's been a little while since the last time we chatted, and I don't want to pop back in and immediately drop bad news on you. So we're going to open up this week on some good news. You remember that video that went viral last year where the TV reporter was broadcasting from the marathon and some motherfucker grabs her ass as he jogs by? And you remember how we later found out that that guy was a Christian leader because of fucking course he was? And that he lived less than 100 miles from me because of course he did? Well, that asshole pled guilty to sexual battery this week. That's right, Savannah, Georgia resident Pittman Park United Methodist Church youth minister and man whose name, church, and hometown should accompany every story about this ever, Tommy Calloway, was sentenced to one year on probation, a $1,000 fine, and 200 hours of community service for the infraction, despite his bullshit claim that he was aiming for her back and his irreconcilable claim that he was just trying to wave at the camera. Anyway, glad to see this asshole was punished for such a blatant violation of a woman's bodily autonomy. 
Christian leaders are still allowed to do that, of course, but only through legislation. But as bad as his crime was, I'm not going to go so far as to say that there's no ass that should be slapped in public without consent, because my next story is about Jesse Lee Peterson. And if I ever run into him at a TGI Fridays, who the hell knows what's going to happen. But yeah, that ass had a few things to say about the dangers of smart chicks. He warned his listeners to avoid them at all costs because, quote, educated women, they don't make for good wives. If she's educated, even the sex is boring because you got to, are you okay? Is this movement right? Am I working too fast here or too slow? You got to talk them through it, end quote. So yeah, I guess Jesse Lee Peterson saw how much meme mileage Shapiro got off of bragging about his inability to pleasure his wife and thought he'd try for a little himself. But for whatever it's worth, I think the problem is overblown. By definition, there's no danger of smart women dating your listeners, buddy. And speaking of misogynistic assholes, Nebraska. Always so easy for me to segue into a story from there. See, Nebraska is one of the 17 states where all divorces are no fault. That is, nobody has to provide any kind of grounds or anything. The very fact that you want to file for divorce is seen as plenty of evidence that the marriage should end, which is so spectacularly reasonable that obviously only a minority of U.S. states would do it. And Michael Dykus would like to see that minority even smaller, which is why he's sued in an effort to end no-fault divorce in Nebraska. The Thomas More Society, the professional misogyny cabal funding this asshole's defense, claims that the law is unfair because, quote, Nebraska's no-fault divorce law allows one spouse to declare the marriage dead, and the courts rubber stamp that without giving the other spouse an adequate chance to argue why it should be preserved, end quote. Yes, the entirety of this man's defense relies on the idea that the state might know better than his wife whether her marriage is worth preserving. And before you write this off as just some crazy asshole filing legal motions, I should point out that this was just heard by Nebraska's Supreme Court. So quick before some judge rules, I need the legal reason to end this segment. I'll bid you a fond farewell and hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And in Piggott news tonight. (laughs) Thanks. We have a story out of Arkansas, (laughs) so obviously it involves racism, Christianity, and a Piggly Wiggly. Piggly Wiggly. Yep, yep, yep. It begins when one Desiree Middlebrooks had the audacity to have a pleasant interaction with a Piggly Wiggly employee, even though really? he was black. So after witnessing that, Arkansas County Sheriff and father of her child, Todd Wright, decided to verbally abuse her in a tirade that included a lot of uses of the N-word, which she caught on tape and then posted online uh... because he can go fuck himself with a sharpened spoon. But in a public hearing... In response to local outrage over the comments, Wright insisted that he can't be a bigot despite what he said on account of him belonging to the correct religion. So, yes, he defended (sighs) himself from the charge of bigotry with different bigotry. (laughs) Yeah, uh, Don't worry, guys. This is a common, common mistake. I'm not a bigot. I'm a Christian. Okay, I heard right. it. I yes. Heard it. Yes. Have you been listening to Scathing Atheists? A lot of people get confused <laughs> if they listen to Scathing Atheists. So during a quorum court, whatever the hell that is, Wright argued in his defense, quote, I'm a Christian man. I read my Bible every day. I am by no means a racist, which statistically speaking, reading your Bible every day means you're more likely to be a racist. Anyway. Yeah. Yes, it does. You also just said I was only following orders. Uh, well, so. <laughs> so, Quorum court isn't exactly Nuremberg. <laughs> he continues, that video does not show the true picture of me. End quote. Because you know how you're like you're more genuine when you're saying the things that you have to say to keep your job than you are when you're in the privacy of your own home? <laughs> it's like that. Mm-hmm. Listen, I just mispronounced the name of the store. It was just I was trying to say the store's name o- over and over at the African American. Yeah, right. Yeah, person. it's an honest mistake. <laughs> See, this Christian. is cancel culture gone mad. You can't <laughs> yell racial slurs at a stranger anymore without mild consequences for your position of power. I'm a speaker at the RNC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But perhaps sensing that his daily Bible studies weren't getting him off the hook, he also offered angry residents an alternative scapegoat, or scape half goat anyway, in the form <laughs> of Satan, Prince of Darkness. After listing a number of black people whose last names he knew and everything, he pointed out that the real culprit was the devil. And and just in case that excuse wasn't ironclad enough, Wright also pointed out that some of his best dead friends are black. 
What? <laughs> yes, actually. So among the scattershot excuses he flung at the wall was the fact that he was upset with Middlebrook because she had made him late for his black friend's funeral. What's oh, gosh, I can't be late for my black friend's funeral. Oh, okay. Five hot sausages. But then, then <laughs> yeah, I'm headed right, right to my black friend's. <laughs> Who stops at a Piggly Wiggly funeral? <laughs> I need some cracklings for my funeral. <laughs> I need a new shirt. Funeral snack. A funeral shirt and a funeral snack. <laughs> they got a t-shirt. Very tasteful. It's got a tuxedo on the front. <laughs> I can also buy one that threatens to kill you for dating my daughters. It's a twofer. Anyways. <laughs> you guys have been to Arkansas, right? On. <laughs> Say the name of the store again. No, no, no. <laughs> And in not straight enough A's news, uh, high school student Devin Bryant was supposed to attend his senior year at Covenant Christian Academy, a private school that he's attended since before kindergarten in his hometown of Colleyville, Texas this year. However, despite his straight A report cards, just before classes began, Bryant was expelled by the school's new headmaster for being openly gay. Fuck your face. Mm -hmm. But I, I got to say, in fairness, Devin's being gay did cause that lake tsunami that sunk all those MAGA boats <laughs> on the track. So yeah, like, yeah. Fair. You know, it got even a little bit. Sorry, but we are afraid that we're just not going to be able to resist the magna cum laude jokes. They're just going to flit. just going <laughs> to flow right out. As we're going to have to ask you. Yeah. To go. And we have got an absolute buffet of things that should piss you off about this story. So first of all, this is totally legal. Yep. Yeah. Not just legal, but enshrined and defended in the Supreme Court legal, thanks to all those people who didn't vote for Hillary Clinton. So yeah, in 2020, a kid got kicked out of school for being gay, and the official scholarly position of the U.S. Supreme Court is sucks to suck. Yeah. No, and, and if that's not exciting enough, the SCOTUS is also ensuring that we get to pay for it with our tax dollars. Our money will go to that fucking school, okay. too. Mm -hmm. Okay, but Democrats got that message, and we nominated a super <laughs> progressive candidate this time, <laughs> right. so totally worth it, right? Yeah. I feel like Devin gets it. Yeah, Devin's cool. Nailed it. Devin's cool. But you actually don't have to be mad about the big picture stuff. Oh, I do. Yeah, you, you do. do. Okay, so you do, you do have to be mad about that. But you can also be mad about the simpering bullshit letter that headmaster Dr. Tony Jeffrey sent out to the rest of the school describing his decision as, quote, one of the most difficult decisions I have ever had to make in my 35-year career as a private Christian school administrator, end quote. Not adding, because nobody kicked the shit out of me for doing this. I can't stress enough that it's someone had, or if I had even suspected someone would, punch me until I oh, pooped okay. for doing this, I would not have done it because I'm a coward at the deepest possible level. You, you included the word poop, so I wouldn't edit it out. Clever. Well played. Yeah. Well played, Eli. <laughs> it's so weird, though, because like if you get the answer right, it's not a hard decision at all. Really. No, There's really not nothing at all. even to decide then. But don't worry, the story does have a happy-ish ending, at least for Devin. Devin is now in public school where, for the moment at least, he can't be expelled for being gay, fingers crossed. And when his new principal saw Devin's story make national news, he actually called Devin and his family to welcome them to his new school and assure him he'd be safe. Nice, nice. And finally tonight, in putting the um in umbrella news... <laughs> Mark Taylor didn't get sane since the last time we talked about him. I had hopes, but uh, no. Uh, Self-described firefighter prophet and cinematically described guy who refused to take his psychiatric medication right before he started talking to demons. Mark Taylor has taken his timeline <laughs> to the YouTube to explain oh, where the remote controls for the Black Lives Matter protesters have been hiding this whole time. Turns out Where have they been that Antifa has cleverly disguised them as umbrellas. Hey, guys, uh, that guy over there, is, he's holding a mind control button, I'm pretty sure. Let's get out of here. I'm, I'm worried. Wait, no, nope, never mind. It's just an umbrella. <laughs> We're fine. We're fine. Okay, but it really says something about you when in the year of the plague and the murder hornets, you've got to make up Manchurian candidate teenagers for it to be weird for you, <laughs> right? Like, right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's so hard for the conspiracy theorists now. Yes, in his appearance on the Eli had to make a name for a batshit crazy right-wing conspiracy it's YouTube so channel on the fly for an improv bit named 
Red Pill 78. Red Pills, <laughs> my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Taylor offered his thought like products on the BLM protests. I know, I know many of you might have bought into the official story of these being protests inspired by outrage against police violence. An illusion all the more convincing for those of you who are actually participating in the protest. But it turns out that no, it's nothing that benign. According to Taylor, quote, the MK Ultra, it only takes like an hour. There it is. <laughs> there, we found it. <laughs> they have it down to an art. They have it down to a science. They will Both? fragment. Yeah, make a fucking <laughs> a little thing. Twist on it. They will fragment your mind into a hundred pieces, and each piece is separated with a disassociated wall of amnesia, so they can program each piece. Oh, the programming is in you. Yeah, seems inefficient. And yeah, that would be, be a problem without those walls, though. I guess. Oh, okay. he ended with the programming is in you. Now he stole the catchphrase from my Steve Jobs animated feature. Great, yeah. great. Yeah. Now. <laughs> Stevie's great journey is going to be delayed till 2022. Great. All right. So T Taylor, in his capacity as both a firefighter prophet and a brain fragmentation expert, filled in a few <laughs> of the details as well in one of those quintessentially 2020 moments when he added, quote, these guys in the street can't be reasoned with. You can't reason with someone that's being mind controlled. Do you notice the guys in the street with the umbrellas? Those are their handlers. What? That activates the program. What that does, the umbrella reminds them and activates the violence programming. End okay. quote. To break through his psychosis for a second, what he's referencing is people using umbrellas to counteract tear gas canisters that were being thrown at them. Yeah. So what happened is Mark Taylor saw people getting tear gassed and thought to himself, Probably getting pissed off by those umbrellas. <laughs> those are mind control. I can't think of what might be upsetting those folks. Now they're probably going to shoot me from that grassy yeah. knoll. <laughs> Jack, get down. So yeah, it looks like we're going to need a new signal to switch on our relentless protest zombies now that he's figured us out, which honestly, like, it was overdue. I'm thinking this next one shouldn't be something that spurs accidental riots every time it rains. So now that we have an assignment, we're going to close the headlines for the night. Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, Michael Marshall will be here to make it sound like I'm friends with a beetle. Hi, I'm Heath Enright. I'm no illusions. And I'm Eli Bosnick. You know, with just 53 days till election day, there's never been a better time to check your voter registration status. And we know you're certain that you're all set come election day, but statistically, some of you are wrong about that. Which is why we've created you have to fucking vote dot com, which will forward you to a website where you can check your voter registration status in less than 30 seconds. No reminders to set. Nothing complicated to remember. Just you have to fucking vote dot com because you do. You have to fucking vote no matter where you live, no matter what you read on Twitter. You have to fucking vote dot com. You have to fucking vote dot com. Because we can't wait to stop talking about this either. I'm very excited to welcome back my next guest. Michael Marshall is the host of the Be Reasonable podcast, the co-host of Skeptics with a K, the project director of the Good Thinking Society, and the reigning skeptic of the year, according to an organization that he is heavily affiliated with. And as of last week, his skeptical resume got that much more impressive as he took over as the new editor of The Skeptic, the UK's longest running skeptical publication. Marsh, thanks for joining me, man. Hey, thanks for having me uh, on the show and for running through my entire uh, resume, my curriculum vitae there, just in case anybody wants to hire me for another job, then they know exactly uh, everything that's, uh, that's about me there. <laughs> right. No, yeah, you've, you've got room for a few more, plus a <laughs> monthly uh, uh, spot on GAM. And yeah, you, <laughs> what the hell else are you doing with your time? Exactly, exactly. There's a pandemic on. No one's going anywhere. It's fine. Exactly. So, OK. Now, first of all, are, are physical magazines still a a thing in the universe, or is this is this just an online venture now? So, so this is an online venture now. It has been a, a physical magazine since uh, 1987. So I'm taking over a ship that's been sailing for 33 years, which is quite cool and quite. Uh, wow. I can feel the, the the weight as well as the privilege of that, and I'm quite excited about that. But we're going to be online only under under this new stewardship. We are thinking it is possible in the future. We may even go back in print format once we kind of test the waters to make sure that we've got a, a really solid readership here, because I think. 
people can stumble onto the website and we're going to be putting out stuff regularly on the website, you know, a couple of stories a week at least um, from, from writers from all over the UK sceptical scene. And I think people stumble onto that uh, and, and can find something based on a particular topic that might kind of catch their eye and catch their interest. But there is still something to be said about seeing the thing on the shelf. So one day we may return to print medium, but for now we're, uh, we're online and we, we've relaunched this kind of hub of sceptical analysis that I'm really quite excited about. Right on. Okay, so I, I, I want to put this clarification right up front because in this instance, a definite article makes a world of difference. You're the editor of The Skeptic, that, which is a British magazine, not Skeptic magazine out of the US. Are the two affiliated? They're not affiliated at all, nor are we affiliated with The Skeptic in Australia. It just happens that if you're in an English language country and you're going to put together a skeptical magazine, calling it The Skeptic or calling it Skeptic seems like the uh, the natural choice. So we've all converged on a similar name there, but they're entirely separate entities that I suspect is a confusion that I'll be, uh, that I'll be clearing up uh, throughout my tenure as editor. Yeah, you guys will all be getting each other's hate mail from the... Uh, no, it'll be great. No, speaking of which, do you want to talk some shit about America's skeptic magazine? You want to start a, a transatlantic flame war? There's a lot of shit to be talked about, those guys. Well, I mean, what I will say is there will be no space in The Skeptic, the the piece that I'm uh, going to be, uh, be going to be leading, there'll be no space in there for a 3,000-word review of how brilliant Milo Yiannopoulos is. And we won't be featuring <laughs> extended worshipping of the conceptual penis hoax as a fantastic bit of skepticism because we're going to be skeptical of that and actually look at the biases involved in putting those things together. So what we're trying to do is kind of the, the feel that a lot of the projects that I and my colleagues at Merseyside Skeptics uh, have, because the, the Skeptic, I'm going to be the editor, but the publishers of it are the Merseyside Skeptic Society. So it's everybody, the whole team at the MSS, and uh, my colleague Alice Howarth is going to be the deputy editor. And so all of the projects that we really work on, from QED to Skeptics with a K to Be Reasonable to the various kind of activist stuff we've done, like 1023, all of those things really try and showcase the, the compassionate side of skepticism. This idea that skeptics aren't pure logical, pure rational, devoid of all biases robots that some people like to think we are, that I am a man of pure logic and reason, and I can use reason and facts to destroy the people I disagree with. And I think that whole approach is kind of bullshitty and also completely fooling yourself if you think you don't have biases. Right. So the best that we can do is to say, I'm going to examine my own biases and see how much they play into it and try to minimize the impact of them. But I'm also going to appreciate that I'm human and fallible. The people I'm talking about and disagreeing with are human and fallible. And the vast majority of people we disagree with aren't evil. They aren't stupid. They aren't gullible. They aren't idiots. They're just wrong. And some of the people we disagree with will be evil. And those people need to be handled in a, in a different way. Oh, I'm American. Yeah, no, it's... <laughs> yeah, but, like, <laughs> but the majority of people we disagree with are just wrong. And being wrong isn't a crime. And shouting at them about how wrong they are won't necessarily help. So we're going to try and showcase the compassionate side of skepticism, this kind of compassionate skepticism that I, that I really wholeheartedly believe in. And I think in that regard, we may be different from some of the skeptical outlets you see in some of the other sort of skeptical uh, writing you see in, in other more established places uh, in certain parts of the world in certain parts of certain countries. Well, that that's awesome to hear because, I, you know, I long believe that you're not doing skepticism right if you're not turning it inward first. Mm. And there is a, a, an overabundance, I would say, of people in the skeptical movement who do the exact opposite, right? Who, who get into it for exactly the reason that you're saying so that they can tell somebody else how wrong they are mm. and forget to look at their own information, forget to look at the sources that they agree with, forget to look at, you know, the things that they want to be true with that same skeptical lens. And, and so that's, that's very heartening. That's, that's really nice to hear. Do you think we're going to see any other like major changes under your editorship? Or Well, I mean, what we are looking to do is to take on quite a lot of new writers. So I've been very fortunate that the fact that I work for the Good Thinking Society and the charity for a living, and I do a lot of traveling around the UK and occasionally around the world, meeting people who are really into skepticism and, and are doing some fantastic work in skepticism. The fact that I'm able to do that means I, I can find people who I think are doing the kind of skepticism that, that I want to show the world and tell the world all about. And I've been able to, to reach out to a lot of those people. And some of my colleagues at the MSS have reached out to a lot of those kind of people to say, would you write for us regularly? So the idea is a lot of those people that, I've, that I think are doing fantastic work in skepticism, who might not normally have been a voice in skepticism, who might not normally have had a platform outside 
outside of their own kind of thing they, they've made. It might not have always been considered to be mainstream skepticism, but they're absolutely skeptics. They're going to be writing for us quite regularly. And so we've got some fantastic articles coming up, not just from across the UK. And we've got writers like, um, well, uh, Pixie Turner, who's obviously been on Good Awful Movies. She's going to be writing for us a lot about nutritional myths. We've got just loads of people from the UK, but we've also looked a little internationally in places you might not necessarily have thought. So in Brazil, there's a huge need for skepticism right now. And there are some fantastic people doing some absolutely brilliant work. And and two of those people are Natalia Pasternak and Carlos Orsi, who are running the IQC, the Institute for Questions of Science in, uh, in Brazil. And they're going to be writing for us regularly about not just skepticism in Brazil, but skepticism from that perspective of what is Sa- South American, Latin American skepticism like? What does it mean to be a skeptic when you've got the culture around you of Brazil, which is a very different culture from the UK. And it's a different culture from the English language first places we'd normally hear from. And I think we can be very guilty in the sceptical movement of thinking that scepticism is an English language phenomenon, mm-hmm. you know, that, it, that it, it happens in Australia and America and the UK. But there's fantastic work happening right across Europe, for example. But we don't hear about the wonderful, wonderful work that's happening in Italy because we don't speak Italian. <laughs> and so we don't go looking for it. So we are looking to have a, a bit of a broader eye to Europe. And I guess people who whose work is sceptical, who might not necessarily have deemed it that way, who might not necessarily have worn that label. And maybe for some of those people, they might not have worn that label because they've looked at what they think a skeptic seems to be. And they've seen the kinds of people who who wear the, the badge of skeptic as that kind of sword of truth that I am a skeptic, you know? And I think that's why we do want to go in this direction of, of looking a lot more about applying skepticism rather than just pointing out why people are wrong. Because you do, you're absolutely right that you get people who come into skepticism in part because they just want to be right. And they have this, they can have this attitude occasionally of, you know, I am a skeptic. Now, point me at something to be right about. You know, the, the people who assume they are right because they are a skeptic mm-hmm. and therefore completely fail to address their own biases and, and things. And that leads you into all sorts of problems. And instead, what we what we really want to be looking for is I'm a skeptic, which means I'm going to try to be skeptical as often as possible. I'm going to fail because I'm human, but I'm going to fail a lot less because I'm trying than if I wasn't ever trying because I assumed I was infallible. So yeah, there's a few things we're looking to do, but um, I, I think... The voices we're trying to put out and the topics we're looking to include, which are kind of outside of your everyday skeptical topics at times, is kind of what we're looking to do. And to to showcase that skepticism is a really broad non-church and a really vibrant community of lots of different people with lots of perspectives. And we want to show off some of that, really. Yeah, well, you know, you brought up Pixie Turner, who is a great exemplar of exactly what you're talking about, right? This is a person, for those who aren't familiar with her story, who got into this as a person who was pushing the woo, who was Mm. pushing a lot of the same food woo that you'd get off of a a food baber, Gwyneth Paltrow, decided to educate herself on it, realized she was doing it wrong, right? Realized that she had the facts wrong and then shifted gears without ever insulting her former followers or former uh, bands on Instagram or anything and just started putting out the true instead of the false Mm -hmm. without any judgment or anything like that and has done a world of good in that in that small universe. So, uh, yeah, I I think that's really good. I'm, I'm, you know, obviously it's not the style that we use on The Scathing Atheist because The Scathing Atheist is not an outreach show. We're here for the atheist. We're a place to go when you're sick and tired of dealing with all those people and you're like, oh my God, those motherfuckers. (laughs) But it's really good to have resources like the one that you're putting out there to be able to put in the hands of somebody who is, you know, like you say, a, a reasonable but misinformed person. Yeah, I, I think that's it, really. And, and as you say, Pixie's a great example of that. You know, Haley Stevens, who was a, a, a ghost hunter until she really spent... The, the more time she spent hunting ghosts, the more she realised she wasn't finding ghosts, the more she realised there were better uh, reasons for it. And then she carried on being a ghost hunter, even though she knows that she strongly feels it's unlikely that there are ghosts, so she could try and explain the things that people are seeing. And I think that style of scepticism is so valuable because it, it is approachable. You know, it is it is something that if you were misinformed in some of these areas and you stumble across what is a fairly fairly straight, fairly empathetic, non-judgmental approach to explaining 
how we know what is and what isn't true, or how do we know what what might not be and what might be true, you know, in those kind of ways, I think you're much more likely to change your mind. But I think that idea of having compassion for the audience, and, and even, you know, the stuff you do on scathing, you guys will call people assholes and you will insult people, but there is undeniably a core of compassion all the way through what you're doing. You're not doing it from a position of, I am better than everyone else. You're doing it from a position of, let's all try to be better. And if people aren't trying to be better, that's the thing you're calling out. And I think that's kind of, it fits uh, in the same kind of way of the, the intention of the skepticism is that it's really, in many ways, getting the right answer is the easy bit. Mm -hmm. And people see that as the entire journey. I've got the right answer on this, the end. But really, that's the easy bit. The hard bit is being able to spread that right answer. And even further than that, being able to spread that right answer in a way that people will actually listen to. Those are, I think, the the most important things we can be doing in skepticism. And that's that's what we're trying to do, really, is to is to put that information out in a way that people will hopefully be receptive to it. Yeah. And I mean, let's let's face it, like in the skeptical world, in the atheist world, basically, we're trying to be, you know, the things that get us into it, at least the, the, the most visible aspects of it are us getting the easiest fucking questions imaginable. Right. You know, like does Bigfoot exist? Is there a God or are, are aliens really the answer of what came and visited this redneck from North Dakota or what? You know, these are pretty easy questions. Yes, absolutely. So, OK, so you mentioned that the skeptic began in 1987 mm. and that's disturbing for me because that forces me to reckon with the fact that 1987 was 33 goddamn years <laughs> ago and, and I'm very old because I remember that really well. Would you say like how have the challenges changed for skeptics in the last three decades? I know that's a huge question, but from the perspective, from your perspective, looking back at what the magazine was focused on when it first began. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I, I haven't read every single issue uh, of it, largely because I was four in 1987. But having looked back at the the, the style of skepticism and the topics, Braggy. I think I've always had this idea, the longer I've been in, involved in skeptical activism, I've kind of developed this idea that when skepticism really first kicked off, it was things like Bigfoot, and it was Uri Geller bending spoons, and it was aliens and, and psychics. And it was that kind of paranormal stuff you know, the fringes and the ephemera of society, the kind of the, the fantastic little corners. And I, and I find that stuff really, really exciting and really interesting. And I think skepticism, those were by and large the topics that skeptics covered for a long time. But over time, that started to shift and it started to shift towards medical misinformation. And I think when I first got involved in skepticism 10 or 11 years ago, medical misinformation was, I would say, by far the most prominent type of pseudoscience that skepticism was uh, was addressing. And I think that the skeptical movement changed in, in, in many ways around that, because prior to that, it had been, you know, magicians and physicists, and physicists saying that the moon landing happened and aliens aren't visiting us, and magicians pointing out the way in which Uri Geller was bending spoons without using the power of his mind, or at least only using the power of his mind to control his hands and his feet as he was bending the spoons. <laughs> right. Yeah. But once things started to move towards medical misinformation, I think the skeptical world kind of upskilled and, and changed its skill set to include a lot more people who are you know, doctors and surgeons and, and scientists from a much more biomedical area. But I think even the last 10 years, skepticism's changed again. And it feels like the pervading pseudoscience of our time is conspiracy theory, which still covers the fact that aliens are visiting us and 9-11 was an inside job. And it still covers the fact that they've cured cancer, but they don't want you to know about it. But it feels like it, it's something else. And I don't necessarily know who the go-to set of people are for combating conspiracy theories. We know who, to, who would study conspiracy theories, and there are psychologists who understand the, the psyche and the uh, psychological makeup of people who are more prone to believe in conspiracy theories. But that's being able to identify the fire rather than necessarily identify how to put the fire out. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what we need to be really looking at is what are the techniques you can use to, to dismantle those conspiracy theories. And, and I don't know necessarily that it is just a case of when it comes to medical conspiracy theories, just pointing out actually that cancer is this and this is how we treat it and this is why cannabis oil isn't the miracle cure and big pharma aren't suppressing it. I think there's something else we need to be looking at. And I've tried to be exploring that area more and more, the the, the times that I've been spending with flat earthers and on Be Reasonable talking to people who believe in all manner of things. But it feels like that's that's where skepticism is right now, is the world is conspiracy theory. We had QAnon marches in Liverpool just last week. That's insane. I, I saw that 
Yeah, I saw that in in the skeptic, I, and and I was blown away. That's that's made it across the pond. Yeah, and and what really blew my mind. It's a small detail, but I think it's really telling. Is that they were carrying placards saying, you know, save our children from the pedophile satanists or whatever, but they'd have pedophile spelt in the American way. Huh. Well, that's really interesting because it shows you where you're getting your source of knowledge from at that point. That even a word that is very well known in England and um, you'd spell it the American way because that's where your cultural influences are on this. But how a QAnon conspiracy theory, as ludicrous as the QAnon conspiracy theory is, it is so mainstream right now. And if and when a COVID vaccine becomes available, we'll see just how mainstream it is because we're going to have to fight a real a real anti-vax movement even to get a COVID vaccine out. So the the fact that conspiracy theorists aren't just huddling together in small groups in dark corners of bars talking about how JFK was assassinated, but are actually your auntie on Facebook sharing yet another meme about how Fauci is actually paid by globalists behind the WHO and how Soros is uh, is responsible for it all and Bill Gates is responsible for it all. That's conspiracy theory now and it's everywhere. So I think that's where we, we've, we've got a, a lot of work to be doing. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing to think the way that like you said, you know, with when it's medical misinformation, you can just go to doctors. But mm. now it, it, you're forced with with conspiracy theories to, to have this scattershot approach where you have to have like you, you just look at 9-11, right? You're going to have to have structural engineers to knock down parts of it. You're going to have to have people with aviation expertise to to knock down parts of it. So in order to, to hit these conspiracy theorists, you, you just have to have sort of a, a, a bevy of experts in everything. But I think that's true. But but even then, you can have structural engineers to knock down parts of it, but you don't mm-hmm. knock down the movement because the detail right. that people bring out to tell you why they think the, the Twin Towers was a, a controlled demolition, the detail they bring out to tell you that might be about structural engineering, but that's not why they believe it. That's how they're trying to persuade you to believe it. You know, it's the same kind of thing with religion. You know, you go through the, the Bible and they say, well, you know, this particular point about uh, the Bible is uh, must be true for these reasons. That's not why they believe it. So you can debunk that point and they'll just move to the next because the reason they believe is actually something else. And I think that's where we kind of miss a lot of this is we can spend a lot of our time, to use a sports analogy, playing the ball, not the man. You can carry on going forward, you know, taking out the detail of the argument they're bringing, but they've got a thousand other arguments that they believe in just as little mm-hmm. <laughs> because really the reason they believe in it is is something else. And if we can't get to that nub of, of something else, the, the real reason they, they believe this extreme theory, then we can knock down the cardboard arguments they put up left and right, you know, like a, like a shooting gallery at, uh, at the carnival, but we're never actually getting to the hub of what they really believe. Right. No, that's a great point. Um, so it, it just proving once again that the the job is infinite and we don't know how to do it, but uh, <laughs> we're still fucking away. But I mean, it. I'm optimistic. I am optimistic. <laughs> yeah, we're going to try. <laughs> so obviously, I encourage all of our listeners to check out Marsh's work over at skeptic.org.uk. You're going to find that linked in the show notes. And Marsh, thank you so much for what you're doing, for the time you're putting into this and uh, best of luck with the new venture. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks a lot. Before we save and quit tonight, I wanted to let you know that the book is still a thing and it actually has a title now and a a sort of vague publication date-ish thing. It's going to be out early October. That probably means first week of October, we're thinking. And it's called Outbreak, A Crisis of Faith. And thanks to Heath, it also supports this amazing subtitle, How Religion Ruined Our Global Pandemic. That's good. That was Heath. That's, that's good shit. We're going to have a publication date real soon. And when we do, I'm going to be hitting you up to pre-order it. So look for that coming hopefully this time next week. Anyway, that's all the blast movie we've got for you tonight. But we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. And if you can't wait that long, be able to look up for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptic Crowd, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Monday. And even new episode of our sister show's hot friend, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And an even new episode of our half sister show, Citation Data, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd fall short of your expectations if I neglect to thank Keith Enright for always being so damn thankable. I need to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Delusions for managing to fit us in with all the shit that she's already juggling. I need to thank Eli Bosnick for managing to still be funny despite not having slept through a night in some 14 fucking weeks or so. I need to thank Marsh one more time for giving us some of his time on short notice. I also want to thank Nightlighter for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. If you're a fan of hip-hop, you'll find a link to some of his stuff in the show notes. It'll be there regardless, actually. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best people, Randy Phoenix, Rod Vittner, Aaron, Randy, Wyatt, Ryan, Taylor, Jasmine, Tanner, Anonymous, Dan, Moritz, Sarah, Abby, and Jamie. 
Randy Phoenix, Fred Vittner, Aaron, and Randy, who have enough tongue dexterity for freestyle Icelandic rap. Wyatt, Ryan, Taylor, Jasmine, and Tanner, who are so hot, open flames warn their kids not to touch them. And anonymous Dan Moritz, Sarah, Abby, and Jamie, whose intellects are so overwhelming that the National Weather Service issues warnings when they brainstorm. Together, these 16 savory secularists secured supplementary sustenance for our sacrilegious screeds this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the illiterate of qualities it takes to give us money, but if you think you're up to the challenge, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres, Tim Robinson handles our social media, our audio engineer is Mark and Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used for permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. People still saying dot com after stuff. I am. I say forward slash. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC. Copyright twenty twenty. All rights reserved.